Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Polygon Academy. Tim here as usual, and this is episode five of the ArtStation Challenge vlog series. In this episode, we're gonna take a quick look at the current state of the scene, now that I've added some grass and trees, uh, and then I'm gonna give you guys a quick demo on how I went about creating those assets. From the start of this challenge, ever since I picked uh, this concept, I knew that there was gonna be quite a lot of foliage work involved, seeing as it takes place in a forest, and uh, I haven't created any trees or bushes or anything like that in quite a while. Um, I've been working as a level artist, which means I've been building worlds, doing a lot of world building and placing stuff like that, but actually creating it uh, is a whole nother story. Because I knew this was gonna be a challenging part of the creating that uh, scene from the concept, I didn't wanna leave this to the last minute, just because I know it's probably gonna require quite a lot of iteration, and uh, while I'm pretty happy with what I got right now, uh, I definitely know that another pass during the polish phase will get me to the, the end result that I'm looking for. It took me multiple attempts to actually get to the end point of where I'm at now uh, for these trees and grass. And I'm actually gonna do another pass on the grass because it's starting to look a little too cartoony. Uh, you guys will see when we hop over to the computer. Um, but uh, basically my process, I created all these assets from scratch by hand. And uh, in the future, I'll definitely be definitely be using uh, Speedtree or learning to use Speedtree. Uh, it's just a tool that seems like it's going to save a ton of time in future. But because there's a bit of a tight timeline during this challenge, um, I didn't feel comfortable sitting down and investing, say, like eight or ten hours learning the ins and outs of Speedtree while there's a big deadline approaching. Um, so I kind of went with the process that I was familiar with from working on foliage in the past. Uh, but it did take a couple of revisions um, to get to the point of where it is right now. So I want to give you guys, uh, I'll give you guys a look at that, uh, the different ways I att attempted to tackle making trees in the beginning, um, and then how I actually went about creating them for the current state of how they are in the scene right now. Foliage and game environments can be quite tricky, and there's a, there's a big reason why studios like Ubisoft and DICE actually have dedicated foliage or biome artists, that their entire job is basically making rocks and trees and bushes and grass. Um, and that's pretty much all they focus on for the production uh, of a game. Um, just because it takes a lot of work to get those assets looking really good. And uh, I have a huge respect for those guys that sit down and uh, bust out on grass and, and rocks and trees nonstop for about you know, two years for some games. Um, so it's, it's definitely quite a challenge. And uh, now I have like a big newfound respect for anyone that's doing that on a daily basis. All right, so let's hop over to the computer. Uh, we're gonna take a quick like 30 second look at the current state of the scene, how it's all coming together, um, and then we're gonna go into right into a demo of how I created the trees in the grass. So here we are in the engine, the little run around. You can see I've added some little bits of grass. Collision bug right there. Uh, some little bits of grass. And if I walk up at the scene, oh yeah, some trees are coming in. Um, so before I just had placeholder like cylinders here, but uh, now we're starting to get something that adds a lot of actual like uh, feeling to the scene. Um, and it helps frame this house at the end quite nicely. So uh, yeah, just your standard kind of like pine trees. Um, they're actually Japanese black pines is the, the reference that I used. Uh, so if I run around, you can see that it's starting to feel, it's closing in that canopy, which is good. And uh, it's occluding the fog, which feels nice. But right now when you run out into open air, the fog is super, super overpowered. Um, so I'll have to find a way how to fix that. Yeah, so you can see because the scene's so moody, I'm actually relying a lot on uh, mostly silhouette from these trees um, and the fog to pop that out. So if I, I run this down this way, you can see it's a lot of silhouette work and uh, you get that nice kind of like organic, jaggy uh, feeling from the, the silhouettes of the trees. So yeah, the, the grass right now, uh, I'm gonna do a second pass on it. It's starting, it feels a little too cartoony. Um, and I actually, I sent a message to uh, Mr. Rudy Lamotte, I guess. I hope that, hopefully I'm not killing your last name. Um, but he's a vegetation artist at um, Ubisoft in France. And uh, me and him have kind of chatted back and forth for a while. So I figured I'd ask him for some, for some advice on my vegetation. And he was happy enough to give me some quick tips. And his first one for the grass was, yeah, scale down the blades and space them out a bit and it'll feel a lot less cartoony. So that's what I'm going to do um, probably tonight and uh, hopefully then the grass starts to look good <laughs> because right now it's, it's a little uh, too fat and cartoony looking. Um, but the trees, yeah, if I look up, yeah, they, they're not too bad. Uh, they, could, they could definitely use a second pass on that, on the texture for the leaves and stuff like that. Um, but for the main, you know, the main viewpoint to how they're going to be seen is mainly silhouette. So uh, they're good enough for now and I'll hit on them in the polish phase. So if I walk around the scene, you can see the, the bark normal map actually turned out pretty good. 
Uh, I sculpted that in ZBrush and then textured it in Substance Painter. It's just the tiling, uh, tiling texture. Um, I was a little worried that that big jagged chunk out of the bark will be super noticeably repeated, but uh, looking around the scene, I've, because I've rotated the trees at different angles, it's actually not that apparent and I think I can get away with it. I'll probably give these trees some extra love in the polish phase, spend, you know, like maybe four or five more hours uh, doing some, maybe some decals or extra geo to pop that chunk out. Uh, but right now, I think they're totally good for the, the alpha version of the, of the environment. Um, and it would just be diminishing returns if I was to sit there and, and keep working on them for the next few days while the actual challenge date is quickly approaching. So uh, it's, it's good to get them in to this, the point where I'm satisfied with them, uh, but I'll definitely hit on them if I have more time. So just running around, it's literally the same tree reused everywhere. Uh, it's ridiculously high poly right now. Uh, I, the branches at the base and at the top have the same kind of density of polygons, which generally you want to reduce as you go up, especially if it's going to be seen like this, where uh, at player level, you know, for the first four or five meters, it's good to have that high density. But if I, um, the camera is probably never, ever going to look up super high. So I could really half the try count as the tree goes up. Um, it's not really actually affecting the, the frames per second. I threw it in like a ton of these trees and they're all like 50,000 triangles, which is pretty high. Um, but actually disabling the volumetric fog gives me way more frames per second back than having, you know, like a hundred of these trees. So on the optimization and polish phase, I'll go in and, and tweak it obviously, but uh, right now it's at least my worries. You can see it's starting to feel a lot like the concept. Uh, it's got that green hue to everything, uh, that cyan kind of fog. Uh, it's definitely going in the right direction. Um, I switched to baked lighting just because the results uh, I find are a lot, lot nicer to have all your indirect baked and maybe like a dynamic sun. Um, I'll be going into the lighting in, a, in a, its own video. That's definitely something I'll, I'll cover in depth. Um, so make sure you're subscribed. It'll show up right in your YouTube or Facebook feed. And uh, yeah, but uh, just to want to do a quick test, see what the bake times were and uh, see if it made a big difference. And it really did compared to when everything was uh, just 100% dynamic. Um, but I'm not going to focus on that too much. I just want to do a quick test and everything has like little, you know, tiny little 16 or 32 uh, pixel light maps and the results are, are pretty good and the bake times, not too bad. So knowing that I can kind of plan how I'm going to work on things moving forward. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to sit and waste a whole ton of time on lighting because once I get everything in place, then I'll actually sit down, focus uh, on making it look really good with the lighting in the post process. But for now, just a quick test and uh, the results are starting to look pretty good, I think. All right, so now that you've seen how the current state of the scene is, and uh, you've seen the trees in action, let's go into how I actually went about creating them. So we'll hop over into 3D Studio Max first, and I'll do a breakdown on these trees. So for these trees, I actually started with the trunk. It's um, probably, you know, the foundation for your tree. So uh, what I did is I originally initially tried doing a unique sculpt for the, say, the first four meters of the tree. I know for like uh, games like Battlefield and Battlefront, they use photogrammetry and then what they do is they have a really unique base of the tree right at player's eye level uh, and then they transition to a tiling texture as the tree goes up and that's something I was going to try and play around with. Um, I tried it out, actually if I flick over to ZBrush here, you can see that I sculpted uh, you know, the first four meters of the tree um, and a roots piece that I was going to try and make like a modular piece that could rotate and around together. Um, but when I did a, I, I, I stopped after this point, did a quick bake, brought it into the engine and I wasn't too happy with the results. So I decided to go with the more like traditional method of using a tiling texture for the bark and uh, just use tiling textures for the entire tree and add, add my details with uh, either alphas or just directly into the texture. Which I did is I, I made the peeling bark right into the tiling texture itself. So if I hop over to back into Max, what I did actually use ZBrush for though is I created this little base mesh for the first, yeah, the same thing, the first like maybe four meters of the tree, uh, four or five meters of the tree. And I actually took that into ZBrush uh, and sculpted it at a low resolution to get a more organic shape to find low poly for the tree that I would just then UV and add a tiling texture to. That way I'm not sitting there poly modeling it in Max. Um, this shape's really organic. So by just quickly sculpting on a low res mesh in ZBrush and then maybe going down one subdivision level and then exporting that to 3D Studio Max, I actually came back with this, which is, uh, you can see like it's a lot more nice wavy organic shapes. And it was a lot faster to do that than just sit there and poly model the entire thing by hand. 
Uh, so it's quite high res. I plan on using this density to do some blending, like vertex blending, uh, but I'll optimize it later on. For the bark, I basically created a tiling texture um, based off of a sculpt I did in ZBrush. If I hop over to ZBrush, bang, here you can see. Uh, I just used some alpha brushes and did a quick sculpt. Uh, I turned on wrap mode for the brush, so basically if I sculpt over the sides or the top, uh, it loops around and, and sculpts the continued stroke at the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube tutorials on sculpting with wrap mode in ZBrush. Just do a quick search, you'll find plenty of them uh, on lots of resources on sculpting tiling textures. Um, then once I had my tiling texture created, I brought it back into Max. And here you can see the UVs for this tree. I basically did a, a cylindrical unwrap on it, um, went in and then cut off each of the roots, uh, took the seams and placed them all on the bottom. I just basically grabbed each root, did a quick planar project on it, uh, cut in, like use the break function to cut in the seam along the bottom, relaxed it so it spread out, and then just went in and stitched along the top as far as I could until it started to really uh, stretch. Um, there's still like little seams on the side you can see, but uh, if I actually close that and zoom in, yeah, you can see that there's a, a bit of a texture seam, but on a, on a texture that's like really noisy, like tree bark, you're probably never ever gonna get close first off to see, to see that seam. And uh, naturally noisy textures like brick or bark, uh, you can have pretty aggressive seams that no one will ever notice because um, when the camera's moving, you, you don't even see it. And if you look over here, here's the, the alpha texture for those, uh, for those, those cards. Basically what I did is I, I'll show you how I created these um, pine branches in a second, but I basically rendered to texture these kind of shapes. Uh, I went in and then I cut them out to reduce overdraw, which is the empty area in between them. Um, it causes performance hits, so I basically I, I just chopped around them. It's better to have a few more extra polygons than have like a lot of empty extra alpha space that's on top of each other in the engine because that'll kill your frame rate a lot more than like a few extra thousand polygons. Uh, so yeah, just take, took that one texture, sliced it up uh, into flat shapes, and then basically took those and started to add some shape to them just by pushing and pulling the birds around. Uh, just basically just took them, you know, gave them some form, uh, yanked them around. And the, the red at the base is actually just red vertex color because what I'm using that for is in Unreal, I'm gonna set it up so that anywhere where there's red vertex color on that uh, shader, it's, it's not moving. And that way the, the, when the fake wind is in the trees, the bottoms of the branches won't be swimming on top of the other branch. And uh, they'll, so they'll remain fixed, but then the actual ends of the branches will kind of like nicely move in the wind. I just literally took those pieces and duplicated them along this little like uh, branch that I modeled. It's just crash geometry. I didn't even uh, go in and, and cut it in or weld it because on a high frequency mesh like this, you're never gonna ever see that like one little tiny seam unless you get up super close, in which case, yeah, you'll, you'd see a texture seam anyways uh, and it just saves time and, and energy. So if I go over here, you can see I literally took those branches scattered them up the tree and created a tree out of those three three pieces. If I turn on the wireframe, you can see it is uber high poly right now. Uh, I'll optimize it later on. Um, just probably kill a bunch of this alpha at the top and uh, you know collapse some edges, make it lower poly at the top and then keep it nice and high and fresh down at the bottom. So it looks real good when the camera goes up close to it at uh, player's eye level. For the branches, I used the object paint tools in 3D Studio Max to basically paint the pine needles along uh, a quickly modeled branch and then just made a render texture from those objects. So here you can see the, the one that I used for my actual texture. And uh, right over here, so I quickly modeled some branches and gave them a really quick UV. Uh, there's a bit of stretching and seams here and there on them, but I know that most of that branch is going to be covered by the pine needles anyways. So spending a bit of time to really like, you know, perfectly UV them when it's probably never gonna be seen is, uh, is not really efficient. So what I did is I basically just created a cylinder, you know, cut in some extrusions, of the branch, and then I uh, gave it a quick turbo smooth. And so for the object paint in Max, 
<clears throat> basically what I do is I, well, up, up here is the object paint section. Um, what you can do is you can change this to paint with objects in list. And then if you click that, it'll say, you know, what, what objects do you want to paint with? And I created these little pine needles down here. They're literally uh, cubes that I've just given a bit of a bend to. Um, I made three different like heights just to add some random and three different colors uh, to add some random variation. Uh, and then you just grab these, hit pick or add selected, sorry. So needle one, two, three. And uh, up here, I'm gonna change it to all randomly. So it paints all three of these pine needles, uh, but at random intervals instead of just one. Uh, and then what you can do is paint on, you choose uh, select objects. So I'm gonna select, say this branch here. Oops, I'm gonna remove that because I added it to the list accidentally. Close that paint objects, grab this. And it's because it's set to paint on selected objects. Uh, it, whenever I paint, it's gonna snap directly onto the surface. Um, for my painting, I have it set to ramp for the scale up here. And uh, basically that way, when I paint a stroke of, of these pine needles, uh, it'll go from larger at the bottom of the stroke, and as I go up the branch, they'll get smaller, just like how pine trees kind of are in real life. Uh, they all tend to get thinner as the branches go along. Um, and I set my scale, it's a uniform scale to be from large to small. I think by default, it's actually set from small to large, uh, but I just change it so it can scale from like, say 100% of the actual size down to maybe 50%. Um, and that way, yeah, as I draw my stroke, it goes from large to small, which is exactly what I want. And uh, the spacing is up here is set to basically one object will be painted every centimeter with a, with a stroke. And then I just grab this, click that, and start to draw these needles onto my object. I'll just do a quick demo here. Super fast and easy. See they kind of grow out of the surface, which is nice. Now very quick, I'd probably spend a lot more time if I was actually doing this again. Super fast. There we go, cool. Uh, and then what you can do is, here you see I have my, my Y rotation set to minus 35. If I set that to zero, it comes like straight out of the branch, which doesn't look that great. If you look at reference in real life, all the pine needles kind of flow uh, outwards from the, the branch along the length of the branch. So I just set, I played around with this number until they started to rotate upwards um, and got something that I liked. So maybe like minus 25 or something like that. And. Uh, I'm painting with the, the objects aligned on their Z axis. And basically, if you look at this, Z is up. So it's painting with the, that coming out, that axis coming straight out of the surface. And uh, what I did is I actually moved the pivot of this object up a little bit into here. So when it paints it, it snaps the pivot to the surface. And uh, that way, this little bit down here at the bottom um, that's below the pivot will be stuck inside the branch. And that way, I won't have little gaps in my, uh, in my pine needles coming out of the branch. So yeah, I basically did that. And uh, I believe these are all instances. So say I change the bend on this one, you'll see everything start to update, uh, which is really handy. You know, if you say you want more bendy pine needles or when I turn on turbo smooth, uh, they go a bit more high poly for when I want to render the, the normal map out. Um, same for this third one, you know, oh, I want a different uh, bend amounts and just a little bit more chaos in my in my, uh, my meshes, and I gave each one a slightly different shade of green. That way, when I uh, rendered the texture, the diffuse, I'm getting a subtle color variation. Uh, it's a little bit too much right now, so I would actually keep it fairly consistent, uh, you know, not too, too many different shades. Uh, that was a tip that Rudy gave me. He said, yeah, there's a little bit too much color variation in your texture, and it's reading a little bit noisy, because um, he was helping me troubleshoot this, and he said, uh, keep the, the overall needle density quite like, uh, you know, some spacing in between them. And then that way your alpha will read a lot better. If you look at the ones that I have right now, they're super crazy dense. And uh, he's like, ah, yeah, no, let's maybe tone that down a bit and your texture will read a bit better. So I'll probably quickly redo this. 
uh, on the in the polish phase to get some a texture that reads nicer from a distance uh, using his tips. So thanks, Rudy. And once that was all rendered out, you can render out the alpha, the normal, the AO, all that stuff. I basically got this texture from that. Uh, and then now we come full circle. So I took this, chopped it up, created branches, and then put those branches on the tree and exported it to Unreal. And uh, if I hop back over to my scene, here we go. So you can see the final end result. For the grass, I literally used the exact same process. Uh, I use the shape similar to the, the pine needles. Um, they're a little bit fat. I'm gonna go in and slim them up so it reads better, more realistic and less uh, cartoony. And uh, probably less dense too, so I don't get that like fuzzy like line kind of look where it, lo it looks like an alpha plane right now. And I want like maybe more different separate planes with uh, finer grass so it's a bit more realistic. So I'll be going and doing a second pass on the grass pretty quick. But uh, it was literally the same process model three blades of grass, uh, paint object paint them along a flat surface and then render that texture and then apply that to some alpha planes. And you can see down here, definitely looking at the diffuse, yeah, it's, it's pretty cartoony and uh, they're pretty like fat and chunky. So I'll do a second pass on them. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a big part of the scene so it's worth spending some of the time to put in. But uh, at least I got something in place and I kind of know where I need to pivot and go from from here. So I hope that kind of gives you an overview of like uh, how to create some trees and grass if you're working on a like, scene with foliage yourself. Uh, it's definitely not perfect. Um, it would be a lot faster for me to use speed tree, uh, and that's one of my things that I'll put on the list to learn in the future. Uh, just because I mean, even at 20 bucks a month, I think is the subscription price for speed tree or something like that. Uh, that is like far outweighing a lot of like spending eight hours doing each tree by hand. And uh, I know once I invest a bit of time into that, it's gonna pay off dividends for any future scenes. Um, definitely a lot of studios use speed trees, stuff like that. Some artists like, uh, or students have the mindset of like, oh, you, if you don't do everything by hand, you're, you're, you know, it's not, it's just cheating. And uh, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Using tools to effectively create things um, is a huge, huge win in a production studio. So uh, I know a lot of uh, senior artists just kind of scoff at that mindset and uh, it's, it's pretty funny. So. Um, like I said, yeah, don't be afraid of, of learning tools like that. Uh, for me, I just didn't want to, I didn't have the time to sit down and really learn it in order to just create one tree for my scene because I'm literally just using the same tree over and over. But uh, in future, I'm going to sit down and learn that program and I think it's going to make my life a lot easier than doing this all by hand like I just showed you. But a basic overview of the process, create your, your overall geometry, create a couple tiling textures for the bark. Uh, create your alpha cards and then assemble all the, the branches and leaves and then just assemble your tree and then bring it in engine. So fairly straightforward. Um, if, if you, you know, I feel like I skipped over something, let me know in the comments and I'll try and do my best to answer you uh, and get back to you. All right guys, I hope you enjoyed that little look at the process I use for creating foliage in my scenes. Um, like I said, it's not quite where I want it right yet. Um, but I will be doing another pass during the polish phase just to bring them to that extra level of quality. Um, and like in the beginning, I mentioned that it took me uh, multiple times uh, or multiple attempts to actually get to the point where I'm kind of happy with what I have. And uh, I actually uh, just recorded another video that I'll be putting out later this week. So make sure you're subscribed. Uh, and it's actually on three mindset shifts on what to do when you fail as an artist. Um, and I know a lot of people when they're first starting out, they deal with failure a lot or they feel discouraged easily. And uh, I'm gonna be giving you three huge tips that uh, I use at all times to kind of keep myself motivated and keep going even when I have to go back to the drawing board and start over. So uh, stay tuned for that. I think it'll help a lot of people um, and I hope you enjoy it. As always, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.